today, it's my great pleasure to have uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Toomey, my friend for many years, um, uh, to um, talk about uh, Sino-American military relationship, conventional balance. I think it's going to be a fascinating, very uh, uh, practical talk for us. Chris um, uh, did his PhD at MIT, uh, wonderful, smart guy, uh, a good friend. We've sorted out problems for a long time, arguing with each other uh, <laughs> to try to understand how the world works. Uh, great mind. I think we're all going to benefit from uh, what he has to say. Uh, he published a really interesting book uh, in the Cornell Security Studies series about how different countries' military doctrines um, uh, influence the way they interpret uh, signals in international relations. So people, you think you're indicating one thing about deterrence to the other country, but they might not get the message because their military doesn't work the same way your military does. It's a really smart insight and um, uh might even relate to some of the issues that we're going to talk about today, but it, it could motivate a lot of interesting research um, uh, in international relations and international security. Uh, Chris really works at the intersection of um, policy and academia. It's a big part of the way his career has worked out, um, uh, um, teaching in the uh, professional, professional military education system, but also advising at Indo-PACOM in uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, Undersecretary for Policy, um, and in the State Department. And I think that's the kind of blend that we really seek at NDISC. And um, I hope his talk will be a great model for us. I'm sure we'll all learn from it. Um, uh, I look forward to learning. Please, Chris. Thanks very much, uh, Huge. Thank you all for uh, taking time out of your day to, to come join us uh, here, or at least those of you for whom it's voluntary. Um, let me give you uh, kind of a, a, a bit of an overview um, in a very kind of non-theoretic approach. I apologize to the faculty around the table. You said that would be okay for me to not be very theoretical. But I think um, some sense of how the emerging Sino-American security rivalry might play out in a conflictual situation uh, can be super useful for helping us uh, think about the diplomacy and the set of uh, tools that we use in peacetime to achieve our national interests and what sorts of trade-offs uh, we want to contemplate. Um, I'll be giving you my views, not those of the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School or the U.S. Navy. Um, I wish they were the views of the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School and the U.S. Navy, but they don't always listen to me. Um, so these will be my own personal uh, views. Um, so we could talk about, you know, uh, uh, a country in general uh, that claims territory uh, outside of that which it controls today. Uh, it claims that the population there doesn't exist as a distinct national grouping or ethnic uh, population uh, and, and a country that blames uh, the expansion of Cold War alliances on increasing security rivalry over uh, that third party, right? And that could either be a generic description of Russia war in uh, the Ukraine or uh, Chinese views uh, over, over Taiwan. Um, there's a steady kind of drumbeat of no slides. There's a steady drumbeat uh, from US senior decision makers uh, in the uh, Pentagon about whether there is likely to be uh, conflict in the near term over Taiwan. Um, uh, Admiral Davidson, who was the PACOM commander uh, in 2021, uh, said Taiwan is clearly one of their ambitions before 2027. And I think the manifest, uh, sorry, and I think the threat is manifest during this decade, in fact, in the next six years. So talking about war over Taiwan by uh, 2027. Uh, up on the slides, you can't quite see uh, the four star from uh, Air Mobility Command, uh, giving a even more pronounced uh, statement that he expects war by 2025. Um, 
uh, and then instructs his uh, uh, airmen to, to go off and uh, do some target practice and make sure you hit all the targets in the head, um, which you don't normally think of as a core function of air mobility command, but he's trying to instill seriousness of purpose and uh, a, a sense that war is potentially imminent. I think both of those um, kind of perspectives are a little wrong, and I'm happy in Q&A to talk a lot about political decision-making in China and why I think uh, that's somewhat overstated. Um, uh, you know, similarly, when we talk about Ukraine, we think there's a lot of very positive lessons for Taiwan. And I think to some extent that's true, but I think those are also overstated. So I'm going to leave those aside and happy to kind of come back and, and talk to those uh, later in the Q&A. Um, but instead, I want to talk about, you know, what war might look like. Uh, and, and, you know, again, not because it's inevitable, but because our policies uh, will have an effect on whether or not uh, uh, it, it occurs. Uh, China's even more so, of course. I uh, don't mean to be taking agency away from them, but I think it's important for us to think about what the policy trade-offs are um, that we need to, to contemplate. All right, the, the thinnest veneer of kind of security studies uh, theory would be to say, if you look at the map of East Asia, it looks like a pretty defense dominant region, right? Uh, lots of water, amphibious assault is extremely uh, difficult. Uh, our, our marine uh, uh, colleagues can, can uh, speak to that uh, at, at, at length and, and practically. Um, I always remind my students what we're talking about defense dominant, political science has a very perverse way of uh, implementing that term or defining that term to mean uh, defense dominant with regard to conquest, not with regard to destruction. What I'm gonna talk about today is an exceptionally destructive war, but just not one that facilitates the conquest of new territories. Um, but regardless, you know, you kind of look at the region, it looks pretty uh, hard to conquer new territories. Uh, a lot of the sources of uh, misperception that somebody like Bob Jervis, um, who, whose work I kind of try to faithfully implement, um, a lot of those sources of, of misperception aren't present uh, strategic ambiguity over the status of Taiwan, notwithstanding. I just don't think there's a lot of misperception about who's going to get involved in, in the potential war and, and what that might look like. So I think perversely, uh, despite the absence of major sources of misperception and the existence of, of uh, defense dominant geography, I still see lots of risk for escalation. So let me kind of try to walk through how I get to that uh, conclusion. Let's start out with... Um, a, you know, kind of simple look at, at how Beijing would uh, look at its range of strategies uh, for, for dealing with Taiwan, right? Ideally, um, they want some coercive tactics that would prevent further sliding towards independence by Taiwan and, and maybe to compel unification uh, of this wayward province that, uh, you know, is, is uh, part of the never resolved civil war from 1949. Uh, and if peaceful means are, are exhausted, they'll want to find some way to, to do that. So how are they thinking about going about that? Um, there's not a lot of focus in the Chinese writings about punishment-based strategies, about using uh, you know, nuclear weapons in a coercive leverage, uh, or even just large-scale conventional attack aimed solely to uh, compel surrender. Uh, and that resonates, uh, again, hopefully with some of the literature you all will have read from, from uh, Pape or Mearsheimer, et cetera. Um, blockades would be another area that they do think a lot more about. Um, but this is pretty hard. Um, the core, one of the, one of the core challenges uh, in the U.S.-China relationship is Taiwan is 10,000 kilometers away from my side of the country, more from here, uh, and, and only 150 kilometers away from uh, China. Uh, but a blockade strategy is going to take a long time to work. And what that time uh, sacrifices from Beijing's perspective is the advantage they have of being nearby on day one of the war. Um, uh, so sustaining kind of sea control over a lengthy period of time, I think, is something the Chinese are certainly creating capabilities that would move them towards, but I think that's that's sort of a heavy lift. Um, and then beyond that, uh, we talk a lot about gray zone tactics, about salami slicing, about China grabbing an island or simply using missiles uh, as, a, as a way to kind of 
uh, create the appearance of a blockade by raining missiles in near ports. And I think that's all worth thinking through. But at the end of the day, that presupposes that things don't escalate. And the only way that that assumption makes sense is if both sides agree they don't want to escalate. And so again, I think it calls uh, our, our attention to thinking a little bit more about what the big war might look like. And so what's that big war? It's a, it's a war of invasion um, uh, where China would look to uh, use certainly an extensive missile force, but also other sets of capabilities uh, to take away Taiwan's ability to defend itself uh, and then uh, affect uh, some sort of uh, amphibious, but also air assault uh, invasion uh, over, over the island. So there's lots of different capabilities that China is developing. Here's one of PACOM's favorite charts. They like showing this one over time because it gets much, much more lopsided uh, for, uh, for red, uh, thus justifying more budget for uh, blue for, for PACOM. Um, but you know, the idea would be the Chinese are building up uh, many hundreds uh, fourth generation aircraft equivalent to an F-16 or uh, F-15. Uh, or F-18, uh, a, a smaller but significant number of stealthy fifth generation uh, aircraft. So they're gonna have lots of air power to throw at uh, the, the problem uh, uh, of, of keeping Taiwan from kind of effectively moving. Um, they, uh, they, they've they got a bunch of other capabilities kind of listed here, um, uh, you know, often sewn together in, uh, uh, something like this, uh, an anti-access area denial web of quiet diesel submarines in the waters near China, um, long range missiles holding US carriers at bay further afield out in the yellowish area. Uh, and then in the middle, a mix of those aircraft, um, but also uh, you know, ship launched anti-ship cruise missiles uh, or, uh, uh, other capabilities uh, to, to hold at risk U.S. carriers. Um, a lot of this really does uh, depend on a huge missile force, um, lots of different ranges. And I think the tendency is to kind of look at these range rings or the, those in the previous uh, slide and just kind of assume that's no man's land. Of course, that's not how wars uh, develop, right? The other side isn't gonna concede uh, uh, your ability to uh, uh, operate um, uh, without, without some fight. But at least the idea is the US needs to be kind of cognizant of that. Um, and so this mix of forces, I think really creates um, uh, a, a fairly dense set of challenges for the US doing what we traditionally do, which is a, rely on uh, our, our nearby allied bases, uh, and B, take advantage of our traditional dominance of the Navy to bring our carriers right up to the shore of whatever adversary uh, we're looking at and then fly as many F-18s or in the future F-35 missions over enemy airspace. In this case, enemy airspace is gonna be very well defended. And the closer you get to uh, the coast of China, the more sets of Chinese capabilities uh, you're going to be vulnerable to. Um, and so, uh, you know, th this kind of creates real problems. The, the, the Chinese kind of recognize this uh, dependency of the U.S. on a small number of assets, whether it's two key bases of Okinawa and Guam, uh, or uh, uh, a small number of carriers, right? And, you know, okay, small, we should be careful there. Uh, how many carriers does the U.S. have? Pick a number. 11, Marines want to pick another number, lightning carriers. How many more lightning carriers do we have? So we, we've, got, we've got 11 super carriers with 70 odd planes. Then we've got another 10 carrier like things that would be a carrier in any other military in the world. Um, but still, that's a relatively small number. You're not going to have all of those on station. Uh, and if each one is potentially vulnerable to a missile strike, uh, DF-26 or 21 have maneuvering warheads on them that are designed to hold at risk those 11 core carriers and, and, and some of the other uh, key surface platforms, um, then the U.S. is going to be somewhat uh, uh, vulnerable. And this is even before you start talking about uh, logistics, right, uh, the, the real Achilles heel of any power projection force. And again, something we've had the immunity uh, to uh, or, you know, rely on safe provision of logistics in both Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Um, okay, well, so 
uh, uh, you know, that's a set of, of, of threats. Um, if, you, if you looked at the CSIS uh, report that looks at some wargaming over this, one of their core conclusions was Taiwan can't do much on its own. If the U.S. doesn't intervene almost immediately, Taiwan is likely to, to fall. Um, and I think, you know, it would be irresponsible um, for us to kind of take that conclusion at face value, given what we know about Russian difficulties in Ukraine, uh, because a lot of the uh, both tactics, but also organizational structures and uh, and, and hardcore capabilities, uh, missiles and, and aircraft and air defense systems are, are going to be parallel. Um, but just to kind of pick at some of the advantages that Ukraine has, uh, it's twice the population uh, of uh, uh, Taiwan. Um, it has been fighting for eight years of war uh, since 2014, whereas Taiwan has um, had a fairly relaxed attitude towards uh, this sort of, of conflict um, and, and instead is focused on you know, my favorite pictures of high-end but not super useful systems in the kind of uh, guerrilla defense uh, that Ukraine is is currently uh, putting up against uh, the Chinese. Um, and then finally, kind of on, on the uh, Ukraine example, um, you know, there's no land border for us to resupply Taiwan with. Any resupply of Taiwan is going to have to come uh, into contested uh, harbors through through that you know dark red zone on on this map, so uh, that that's going to be a, a challenge. So you know I think the assumption is all right. The U.S. is going to have to get involved very early on. We haven't been sitting still throughout the Chinese development of an A2 AD network, anti-access area denial network. We're in the midst of all sorts of doctrinal. Uh, innovation, and I assume everybody knows all of these acronyms by heart. I'm not even sure if, if the military officers know all of them in, in, by heart, right? Some of these are um, uh, of only fleeting interest as we uh, move through our own uh, evolution. From air-sea battle back in about 2010, um, thinking about how we would use our traditional long-range aircraft and strike from the sea naval assets to attack uh, mainland Chinese targets, as a way to take away their power projection uh, capabilities, um, uh, you know, through the more recent systems uh, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, the joint concept for access and maneuver in the global commons, JAMJIC, uh, what is that, number three down there, right? You've got to pronounce all the acronyms if you're in the Pentagon. Uh, they, they've all got uh, uh, approved pronunciations. Um, so, you know, you call it potato, I call it patata. Um, there, there's a little bit of uh, doctrinal innovation for the sake of um, uh, doing something. But I think there's also something real that's going on. And again, not to, not to pick on the Marines, but they're the clearest example. The Marines decided to divest themselves of a very large tank force, right? You don't think of uh, heavy M1 tanks as being all that useful in amphibious assault. They're not. The Marines were being tasked with something rather different uh, during the, the forever wars in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, under the uh, uh, current kind of thinking, they've gotten rid of hundreds of high-end cutting edge uh, tanks uh, so that they can engage in some restructuring. And some of the acronyms down towards the bottom uh, in, in particular, the Marines Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations, EABO, or one that's not listed there, the Marine Littoral Regiment, are trying to kind of conceptualize what an alternative U.S. Uh, force structure uh, might look like. Um, uh, and so let's just start with the land force, um, whether it's the, the Army uh, with a little schematic on the right or an example of the Marine Littoral Regiment on the upper left. The idea would be smaller units operating at sort of the company and battalion level centered on uh, the HIMARS system that we're sending uh, into Ukraine with a couple of long range anti-ship uh, missiles on them. Um, uh, and then surrounding that force with a lot of organic logistics and command and control and sensors so that a small unit could operate on its own uh, and and operate somewhere inside uh, that that uh, danger zone. So that's 
So the blue bases here are somewhat aspirational from the US perspective, but this is an interesting talk to be giving uh, this month as opposed to four months ago because both the Japanese and the Philippines have moved along uh, quite substantially in talking to us about using bases. Um, these capabilities are all really interesting, but they're not super long ranged, right? We're talking about 3000 kilometers from Guam to Okinawa. That's a lot longer range than most of our missiles. Um, but we're starting to build missiles like crazy. So uh, for those of you who work on arms control, you may uh, have bemoaned the US withdrawal of the second to last uh, standing uh, treaty or nearly the second to last standing treaty with the Russians, the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty uh, that we withdrew from what, back in about 15, uh, a little later, uh, it was under the Trump administration. Um, that allowed us to start developing all sorts of long range missiles so that I can soon, I can't find the graphic yet, but I'll soon be able to draw the mirror image of that picture with the red uh, concentric circles emanating from the Chinese territory with US missiles. So uh, the top half here are systems we've already got in place. Uh, the bottom half are ones that are coming along nicely, thank you very much, including some uh, that are quite long ranged or hypersonic uh, in, in uh, kind of their, their flight profile. Um, so the idea would be you, you, you equip a bunch of uh, the units that look like this, send them out to bases to be named later, right? Like the, the, the player to be named later in the trade, uh, bases to be named later somewhere along the periphery uh, who, uh, of China who might be willing to give us permission to uh, uh, launch missiles at the Chinese Navy that is trying to project power uh, uh, towards the Taiwan Strait. All right. Where does that leave me? That leaves me to worry about a variety of different forms. Well, let me step back, sorry. Um, in addition to kind of distributing the land force, that is creating new formations for the Marines and the Army that are centered on long range ship to, sorry, surface to ship missiles, both the Air Force and the Navy have to get into the game. Uh, again, speaking for myself, not for the Navy. Um, so the Navy talks about uh, distributed maritime operations, DMO from the uh, slide of acronyms uh, here. Um, uh, the idea would be uh, that the ships, rather than operating as integrated carrier strike groups, would disperse uh, into much smaller components, an individual destroyer, uh, potentially even a frigate, if we can find a frigate de design that we like, and that each of those ships would be able, again, somewhat organically to be able to target Chinese naval uh, power projection, right? The key for the Chinese is to be able to project power. Well, if we can take away their Navy, then, then that solves the problem for our services. Um, so distributed maritime operations uh, that, that might... Um, operate uh, you know, hundreds of targets rather than a handful of carriers and carrier-like things uh, in, in the Western uh, Pacific, um, but instead give the Chinese a lot more targets. The Air Force has to get in on the game too with agile combat employment ACE programs that would look at maybe five or six aircraft operating from a simple airfield, again, in an air base to be named later. Uh, the services aren't super specific about where they're going to be deploying these. Um, but again, rather than that being Guam and Okinawa, the two key bases that we have to depend on today, the idea might be you'd have 20 or so bases spread out over the region so that that very large Chinese uh, missile arsenal needs to be spread out across all of the different U.S. sets of targets, whether those are distributed naval vessels uh, aimed at, at shooting down uh, Chinese ships uh, or uh, the land-based force, which are going to be very hard to hit, uh, right? Finding tells on the move, finding transporter erector launchers, missile launching uh, tubes on the move is very hard. We did not do a great job in the Iraq war uh, when we had air superiority over uh, the Iraqi force um, to be uh, much harder for either the Chinese or to do that in contested airspace um, over the other side. Um, so you know, every everybody's trying to get in, in, involved in that, and and so where does that leave my sets of concerns? Um, 
So I think this is ripe for escalation in a variety of different ways. Um, let me flag two areas, though, where I, where I think it's, it's less problematic, right? Um, first is nuclear preemption. I haven't mentioned, I don't think, nuclear weapons, uh, at least not, not in any significant way, because none of this is going to hold at risk, at least after the Chinese populate their 350 silos, none of this is going to hold at risk the other side's uh, secure second strike. Um, and so I don't think it's likely to lead uh, to any fear about preemption and this, thus uh, the Chinese needing to feel like they need to launch their own nuclear weapons uh, uh, to, to have a, a survivable uh, arsenal. Um, there's an excellent article about uh, this issue by uh, Caitlin Talmadge in International Security a couple of years ago that I think goes into pretty good detail about uh, the nuclear preemption issue uh, 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 being less problematic uh, than, than it might seem. Um, again, this is something of a new change, right? Um, uh, had there been a large U.S., conventionally armed ballistic missile set of capabilities deployed in the region 10 years ago, I think the Chinese would have had significant grounds for concern with regard to the survivability of their arsenal. Similarly, the second uh, bullet here, conventional missile preemption, I don't even know what that means. Um, you know, it's not something we thought a lot about in the Cold War. Again, it doesn't work real well because finding mobile tells is really hard. Um, uh, you know, and, and so that's just not going to be something that either the United States or the Chinese are going to worry too much about. You're going to have lots of uh, locations if you're dispersed like we're planning to be. And by definition, the Chinese are in their large uh, uh, land mass at home. Um, uh, then, then, you know, you might lose a handful of those launchers, but you're not going to lose the bulk of your force. Okay, so let's erase those maybe, if my build works, yeah, uh, and focus on these others. Um, geographic expansion, I think, is the, the first one to be really concerned about. Bases to be named later are starting to be named. Um, the Japanese are talking about allowing uh, much more expansive use of Japanese islands uh, for, again, the dispersal of these land-based forces and potentially for uh, sending aircraft to uh, uh, you know, different facilities, and whether those might at some point be civilian airfields um, that the Japanese Air Force is starting to use uh, on an ad hoc basis, or or not, uh, or or just you know the rudimentary uh, uh, idea that we just pick a pick a strip of uh, roadway and and use that as a simple uh, base. Um, uh, both of those are uh, you know potential future directions. Um, but that means Japan gets involved, right? Um, that, that we've got uh, a, a third country getting involved. And then more recently, uh, the US and the Philippines have reinvigorated the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement of 2014, which was sort of the beginning of the end of the um, kind of erosion of the US-Philippine alliance that, that kind of uh, uh, really collapsed in the 1990s and early 2000s. But now uh, in the 2014 agreement, um, centered on four bases that the U.S. was going to be permitted to use potentially. Uh, and now the more recent agreement includes another five, several of which are said to be uh, in the far north of Luzon. Oops, sorry, looking on my screen, but not on yours. Uh, uh, so thus, some of those bases at the top of uh, uh, the Philippine island, uh, uh, right up, oh, I can't get it, right up there. Um, start, oh, there's a laser point, you guys have yeah, high tech yeah. here. We don't do that in the Navy. Um, uh, and, and so that agreement, um, you know, might bring the Philippines in. So now we've got uh, the beginnings of kind of a multinational war. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, creates a set of, uh, uh, challenges in kind of coordinating allied behavior. It's one thing in NATO where we have a unified command and uh, a history of working very closely to manage escalation risk. It's another um, with, with the Philippines especially, but to some extent with Japan uh, outside of the Navy to Navy contact. Um, I think the, the degree to which 
uh, we work hand in glove with the Japanese military uh, is, is much less than, than with NATO. So geographic expansion seems uh, highly likely. Second and somewhat distinct, uh, independent third party actions. Um, now that could be Japan again. Uh, Japan is in the midst of buying its own long range strike systems. They're buying the same kind of long range missiles we are. Um, and so when they get hits on day seven of the war because they're letting the US fly from this new diver, uh, dispersed set of bases, they're gonna wanna respond again on their own. Um, think about how carefully we're managing the weapons we give to Ukraine in ways to kind of think about the escalatory signal that sends to Russia a nuclear power. Japan is going to want to hit back and we're going to have to do, again, some very careful arm twisting to make sure that the way that they hit back doesn't lead to the kind of escalation that might go into the nuclear realm that we would be worried about. Even worse for Taiwan, um, because they're going to be getting hit a lot um, uh, uh, early on, and the U.S. has at least uh, turned a blind eye to the Taiwanese development of, again, long-range, uh, relatively precision strike systems. Um, you know, it's one thing to use uh, long-range precision strike to stop a Navy from coming uh, to, to attack uh, Taiwan, um, but it's another to use them against things like the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, or against civilian uh, targets. Um, I think the latter has considerably more escalatory potential and, and, and uh, in the small numbers that either Japan or Taiwan are gonna have those sorts of systems, they're gonna have to be kind of showy attacks to have any effect and that, that might have inherently escalatory um, effects. Fourth, uh, sorry, third area of, of escalation that I think is worth worrying about. The idea that we're gonna break the kill chain, and both sides are gonna to wanna to do this, right? Using those missiles to find US carriers uh, 1,500 kilometers from Chinese coastline is gonna require some high-end sensors uh, for the Chinese side. Um, we're gonna to wanna to take out those high-end sensors. We're used to fly, fighting adversaries who we've already rendered uh, blind, deaf, and dumb, right? Not able to communicate uh, to their sensors, not able to talk to their own uh, maneuver forces. So we're gonna wanna do that with regard to China. Uh, but those are a lot of high-end command and control systems that are gonna be critical to their conventional warfight plan, but also might have some potential uh, nuclear escalatory risk that might have some overlap with the sorts of sensors that the Chinese might rely on for uh, what DOD asserts <clears throat> the Chinese are now moving towards, which is a launch on warning uh, sort of posture for their for their nuclear force. Um, so I, I think kind of that set of targets uh, is less like ships at sea uh, and, and a little bit more kind of command and control nodes near capital or large populated areas uh, inside of China and are going to have a much more escalatory uh, uh, kind of, of potential. And then lastly, um, kind of space. Uh, there's a great piece uh, by Steve Biddle and uh, Ivan Orlik uh, a little bit earlier in international security that, that talks about uh, kind of the command of the commons um, and I think really uh, does a nice job of laying out inherent limitations of anti-access area denial far away from Chinese shores, um, but nevertheless sort of the cost effectiveness of it near Chinese shores. Uh, and, and they presage the idea that US and allies can develop their own set of capabilities, which is what I've described to you here. Um, one of the assumptions that they come to is both sides are gonna see lots of advantage for taking out the other's space assets as one of those key intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets. I'm not um, uh, you know, a space uh, expert, but the idea of uh, Kessler cascades uh, that were popularized um, in the gravity movie at the very least, right? But the idea is you get a chain reaction much as a nuclear uh, explosion or atomic explosion is generated by uh, uh, excess nuclei from a uranium uh, uh, atom being split and then splitting other uranium uh, atoms uh, that in turn generate more debris, more neutrons, you could have the same sort of problem in outer space. I, it's unclear to me whether something like Starlink, something like a, a distributed set of, of uh, lower cost uh, uh, systems 
solves that problem or just creates more potential for debris. Um, but I think at, at the very least, both sides are going to be incentivized to first use non-kinetic, but pretty quickly use kinetic weapons to take away the other side's uh, space-based systems. Um, so I, you know, I, I kind of find those four sets of escalatory potentials to be not easy ones to imagine uh, a way to avoid if we end up having the sort of uh, large scale conventional attack on Taiwan that we are seeing great powers uh, have within their wherewithal to conduct uh, on, on a daily basis, what for, for literally the last uh, 365 days in Ukraine. And so I think it's worth kind of thinking through a little bit about the ways in which this war might be considerably more escalatory and violent uh, and inherently involve the U.S. on day one uh, in the absence of kind of conceding uh, uh, defeat. Um, so as a way to kind of think through a little bit about uh, what steps we'd like to take and what compromises we'd like to make uh, with China uh, so as to potentially avoid that sort of conflict. I'm at about 35 minutes, which is what you promised me I could take. So why don't I stop there? And happy to talk about balloons, of course, because that's what we do. We're all balloon experts um, now, but but certainly happy to talk about kind of the conventional war flight or or some of the politics about how we might uh, avoid that. Wanted me to. Yeah. So thanks, Chris. Um, uh, I will. Pay attention to recognizing people. I will try to favor students. We want to have students out there, so I'm going to look for that. And um, please wait. Is this the only mic? Okay. So when you have a question, and I recognize you. Please wait for Flint to show up with a microphone to ask your question. And who wants in? Uh, Kenzie, I saw first. Why don't you start by introducing yourself, at least to me. Myself? Oh, oh sorry, right. Kenzie, yeah, over here. Oh. Please. Hi, I'm Kenzie. I'm a senior. I'm also an Endisk fellow. Uh, so in a class that I'm taking, we're, we're, we read WAMAC, and we learned about the decision-making process when it comes to small states and large states and how the relationship is different. Um, and, you know, you talked a little bit about the Philippines, but I'm really interested in places like Thailand or Malaysia or India, uh, not India, Indonesia that are small, yes, and obviously do align a lot with like US values. But when push comes to shove, how do we kind of keep them in the America spheres, spheres of influence and not and prevent them from kind of joining in um, and conceding into China's dominant behaviors? So so that's a great question and and broadens beyond the narrow war fight that I'm talking about, right? And, but I think it's really important. Um, but just to, to be clear, they're all too far away to be relevant until we get really long range missile systems. So to some extent, they're less critical in the short term. Now, that overstates it to some extent because one tier back from where you're launching missiles, you're gonna wanna have logistics and resupply and you know logistics being fuel for uh for your naval vessels but also for um for land and air, air. and so you're going to want those to have comfortable homes to come through and if all of those homes are little teeny island bases in the marianas and uh micronesia um that that's a challenge and so having something a lot closer will, will be valuable um uh, you know, I, I think that opens, that that calls for a considerably broader approach to international security than the U.S. has typically done well, at least since the early days of the Cold War, right? And that is primarily a job for the State Department and for uh, aspects of U.S. commercial diplomacy to show that we have ways of competing with Belt and Road Initiative, which I think is overstated, but not, you know, not, not, not a... Uh, non-starter um, uh, that that highlights to them the value of kind of working with us, um, uh, you know. But I, but I think we tend to, at least at, 
as Americans, if you aren't spending a lot of time in the region, we tend to overstate the degree to which our values are inherently something viewed positively out there because they come across a lot as giving economic advice that leads to 1997 like economic meltdowns in the re in that region in particular right uh, and and so I think um, there, there are some kind of challenges to, to think through uh, there but but I think the, the simple answer is kind of whole of government and a little more integration and I think the administration is doing a somewhat better job at thinking about that today than we were uh, in, in the previous administration, but free trade agreements are a non-starter uh, in the American body politic. And that's sort of the big attraction you can, you can offer. The Chinese are way ahead of us on that sort of diplomacy uh, with, with the region. Thank you. Morris, I think you captured somebody over there. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for coming. My name is Maura. Um, I had a question on the AUKUS Alliance and the role you think it's gonna play. Um, in the news of the development of nuclear submarine capability for Australia, do you think that um, the alliance would go so far as to put that kind of like capability and structure in the defense of Taiwan? Or do you think the AUKUS alliance won't go so far in its effectivity of defense of the region? So if you'd asked me uh, six months ago, what countries I thought would be willing to work with the United States in a reasonable Taiwan scenario, not one where Taiwan declares you know, independent, new independence because uh, they've declared independence a number of times, um, but, but not, not in the context of some particularly provocative Taiwanese action. Um, I would have said Australia would be about the only one, that Japan would have been very much on the fence um, uh, and Philippines was, was pretty unthinkable. Uh, and again, that's a really interesting, uh, you know, event in the last month to, to have that agreement of expansion of bases that clearly have a Taiwan scenario in, in mind. Um, so I think the Aussies would be uh, willing to work fairly close with us. Um, I think the AUKUS submarines are a long time in coming. Um, and so it's going to be a while before that particular set of capabilities is, is relevant. Um, did I maneuver this map? Yeah, I, I, I expanded this as much as I could while still keeping Darwin, uh, on the, the um, city in the north of uh, Australia uh, on the map. And again, that's a useful second tier area from which you can fly air to air refueling. You can uh, hold logistics. It's too far to shoot at Chinese ships. Um, but we too can, you know, load up bombers with anti-ship cruise missiles from there. And so I think um, the Aussies aren't going to necessarily bring a lot to the fight in the near term other than bases. And their bases are a little too far away, but nevertheless are going to be useful. And so I think it's kind of a sign of that. Um, I was in Norway uh, two weeks ago uh, talking to them about how they're going to implement air-sea battle. Um, uh, because everybody wants in on, on the acronyms. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted to ask, well, when the Taiwan scenario uh, happens, what should we do? How can we help? And I think the answer for them was the same as the answer for the UK, which is stay home. Uh, you've got another uh, rampaging uh, great power in your neighborhood. Uh, the US is going to be a lot less able to do much about it. So the UK from AUKUS, uh, Again, I wouldn't expect to play a, a major role in, in uh, a Taiwan scenario. Uh, they're going to need to hold down the fort um, more back, back in their primary region. Hello, Professor. Uh, my name is Patrick Marshall. I just want to first and foremost say thank you for coming and speaking here with us today. Um, as a member of the Naval RTC unit, it's quite interesting talking about military tactics and seeing how things in the Pacific could you know, pan out in the future, uh, just because the kind of work that I'd be doing in the future could be very well this uh, we're talking about in theory. Um, my question is, if China were to invade Taiwan in the near future, how would, um, obviously they'd be expecting the U.S. to respond in some sort of way, you know, whether it's first through sanctions or, you know, immediately mobilizing its air ground naval um, units towards the island to help the Taiwanese fight back and reclaim um, Taiwan and or like their country. So if this were to happen, how do you think China would respond to America's response to the invasion? 
Um, do you think that they would like wait and see how the U.S. responds and then potentially like risk losing progress? Or do you think that they would um, respond swiftly and aggressively and kind of like, you know, act with a firm hand? I, I think the Chinese have, have designed a force to hold at risk the U.S. ability to do exactly what you suggest, which is what exactly what I think we'll do. Right? They, they designed a set of capabilities that will make it very costly for the U.S. to come to Taiwan's aid. Um, uh, you know, a A two AD is that it's 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 not it's not aimed to subdue Taiwan itself. It's aimed to raise the costs of the U.S. coming anywhere near Taiwan and getting forces in there to hold at risk the key for the Chinese, which is their amphibious assault force. Um, so I think I think they're uh, expecting it. You know that that part of the decision making calculus is. If we're going in, we're going in with the re recognition that the U.S. is going to be on the other side of this fight. And what does that look like? Uh, again, to them, it almost has to look like hitting Guam, still not quite a single point of failure, but awfully close to it, hitting Guam early on in the, in the conflict, which has some degree of escalatory uh, uh, element because we're kind of hitting not continental U.S., but U.S. territory, right? And hey, this is a war over in your neighborhood. We like fighting wars in other people's neighborhoods. But I think that's part of the problem is we, we need to kind of get, get into the mode of thinking about we're going to be under fire, not just at sea, but, but on U.S. territory right away. So I, I think they have designed around the ability to hit the U.S. very early on and have watched the U.S., what the U.S. is able to do when we're given several months to generate forces in a secure you know, basing structure that's not coming under attack. And they don't like the look of that. And so they're not, they're not going to be happy uh, to, to kind of give us that luxury. Do we have any questions on the south side of the room? I've got a couple of, there we go. Uh, Hello, uh, thank you for coming. My name is Andrew Zita. Um, I was wondering, you were talking a lot mostly about sort of China and then the U.S. and U.S. holding back its allies. Um, and I was just sort of curious about what role North Korea plays in this, uh, because, I mean, it already likes to fire missiles over Japan and is relatively erratic. Uh, Chinese haven't always been able to control them. So I was sort of wondering how they would uh, bring in South Korea and Japan. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm torn. My sense is South Korea, uh, well, sorry, my sense is North Korea is going to be uh, somewhat reluctant to engage in uh, uh, you know, opportunistic aggression when there's surging U.S. forces moving towards the region and a high tolerance for escalation. Um, that would be what we would be uh, kind of displaying. You know, and, and again, if you, if you had a chance to, to look at the CSIS report, you know, they're talking about dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and thousands of U.S. Uh, troop losses uh, right away. And so I think that creates a set of credibility from the North Korean perspective of U.S. willingness to uh, accept casualties that's not likely to embolden them. Um, that said, you know, to, small, to the unpredictability of small states, um, you know, and, and really in both cases, you've got single leaders, both China and, and North Korea, you've got single leaders with, uh, you know, in, insurmountable kind of authority to uh, uh, to do as as they as they choose. The the last thing I would say is, um, you know, the South Koreans I worry about uh, in the same way I worry about the Taiwanese or the Japanese engaging in long range strike on their own in ways that escalate conflicts that the U.S. might not be willing uh, or enthusiastic to uh, uh, to countenance. Um, so in some ways, there's a there's a restrain the ally uh, component there too that I think is important. Thanks. Good issue. All right. yeah. Hi. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us both here and at the breakfast earlier. Um, this was kind of touched on briefly at I think both of these events, um, but. You often hear the expression, you know, the U.S. plays chess, China plays Go. Um, and so I was wondering if you could comment on how the value systems and strategies of those different cultures um, should impact what types of weapon systems and other capabilities the U.S. focuses on developing in the future. 
Great question. Um, I, I've been going to China for like the whole 30 years that I've known um, some of your faculty members here. Um, until oh, a trip in about 2017, I had never seen Go in China. Now I've seen uh, lots of Chinese chess, which is like our chess, only faster and kind of more of a slashing, aggressive, you know, move quickly sort of thing. But it, but it's not the patient strategic. Shangqi is not the patient um, uh, development uh, strategy that that, that Go uh, has. Um, now again, I, you know, it's not it's not that it's non-existent, um, but I just we I think we overstate some of these cultural. Uh, tropes. And I think we need to be really careful. So the question I always ask for the kind of, that kind of strategic culture argument, and, and I don't mean to be pejorative of it, um, uh, as mentioned, right, my, my book focuses on kind of the organizational culture of the PLA, People's Liberation Army, and the organizational culture of, of different U.S. Um, conceptions of warfare over time and how that form of strategic culture can complicate perceptions and, and, and misperceptions. But, but there, I think there's a clear conduit between the cultural trait um, and, uh, and, and the way it has an effect. And that is you practice your military doctrine, you're pr procured to be able to implement your military doctrine. How does the playing of Chinese chess or Go materially affect kind of the strategy thinking uh, in Chinese military leaders, right? That's, that's what I call the conveyor belt question. Where do we see that cultural element in society writ large? And then how does it feed into the military leadership? And because I don't see that playing a dominant role, or at least it's, it's, uh, it has to compete with 10 other sets of culturally imbued games, including lots of gambling and card games and so on, um, that I see quite a bit more prevalent in, in Chinese culture. It's got to compete with those for shaping the way to conceptualize things on the Chinese side. So, uh, you know, I, I always look for kind of a narrower um, set of uh, uh, cultural preferences to try to understand that because I can see a little bit more tangibly how that might play a role. Um, so, Chris, yeah. was that the existence of Macau and gambling and mahjong and whatever is, you know, was that a reference to say, geez, maybe it's not long term strategic thinking, it's a risk taking gambling culture we should want? Like, what if I were a strategic culture guy? Doesn't this say, oh, she got it wrong by saying go, but watch out because the Chinese are, they see a, see a chance, they'll be like, oh, this will be awesome. I get the joy of gambling. Right, right. <clears throat> um, yes, except you see at a lot of levels of Chinese government, um, the op, you know, an inherent conservatism and reluctance to, to take those bold gestures. You know, and again, I can find writings in Chinese military uh, thought where where you know the the, the active defense uh, you know is going early and, and taking bold risks and so on you can find that in Maoist writings too, um, but but you need to weigh that against other parts of uh, you know an inherent conservatism in any organization but particularly in one that has this dual structure of cracking heads to keep the party in power at home uh, and so you wouldn't want to take any risks with that 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 might. You know, um, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, there's definitely a, a gambling culture in 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 China. Um, is it is it more or less intense? Um, uh, yeah. We, we yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor. It's been a pleasure hearing you speak today at breakfast and again now. Um, I'm curious to get some of your input on Professor Golse's 2019 article, uh, which you forwarded me this morning. Uh, that emphasizes the necessity of a shift to defensive defense um, and developing reciprocal anti-access and area denial capabilities. Um, so Professor Gulse, I might be reducing your analysis significantly, and I hope I'm not doing that. I found it very sensible, but my one concern would be that uh, China seems to, in Beijing's estimation, have a prerogative to deny access to the areas in question in a way that Taiwan and Japan don't. 
So of course there is kind of a meaningful distinction between the types of systems that you're deploying um, and focusing on things like anti-access um, is certainly less provocative than something like the JAMGC, um, which Professor Goals explains is like the current um, kind of operational norm in our approach. Um, so that, that is one of my concerns. And the other concern is kind of what you raised in some of your annotations of that article, which is that even though these are defensive systems, there's still the possibility for spiraling and iterative effects. So I would just love to hear more um, on your take on those two matters. I, I think he and I are uh, somewhat aligned um, uh, that, again, to draw out the contrast between the way my students were talking about, we're going to fly F-22 missions over Beijing, uh, you know, back in 2010 under air-sea battle to something that looks more like mutual denial of freedom to maneuver at sea. Yeah, that's clearly got to be less escalatory, right? And, and that is kind of the defense dominant geography uh, and then appropriate uh, uh, recognition of that in terms of what systems you buy. You know, we are buying a whole slew of missile systems that are going to be exactly the right kind of thing to, to implement that. Um, big numbers of JASM ERs and LRASMs uh, that, that are, you know, operational today. Um, that's all good, but the U.S. military being what it is doesn't stop there. Um, and we're going to want to both be able to operate a little bit more closely because some of those systems aren't going to be launchable from all the way back in Guam. They're going to have to come forward. And so what that means is we're going to come under fire. We're not used to coming under long range fires. We're going to want to stop that from happening. And so that gets you into wanting to break the other guy's kill chain. And that means going after command and control and sensor systems that become pretty escalatory. And, you know, and exactly which ones am I worried about? I, you know, I don't know. Over the horizon radars and ground-based control for space systems seem like the easiest things to talk about um, that I can't imagine we wouldn't want to go after, right? Um, but if I'm sitting in Beijing's perspective, right, and it's not... It's not solely kind of a strategic culture argument. It's a little bit of, well, any defense planner would worry, you know, when you lose your sensors, but certainly some ways that they're maneuvering or developing their force, both nuclear and conventional, means that they're more and more dependent on that. And so they're going to care a lot more about those. Um, so, you know, is it, is it bad that we're moving in this direction? No, I just think... Um, uh, uh, given the long range of everybody's missiles, uh, it's not simply a matter of uh, uh, creating um, the final chapter of John Keegan's uh, Price of Admiralty, one of these other kind of classics, is, is the empty oceans. Right? It's not just the empty oceans, it's the empty oceans and holding at risk the first 200, 300 kilometers of land on either side of the coastline. And, and both sides are going to be kind of engaged in active pursuit of, of attacking there. And that sounds pretty escalatory. But I can't find, you know, I don't see a whole lot of uh, sensitivity to that by either by either side, right? And that's again before you get into third party actors, which I find um, uh, particularly worrisome. Yeah, you could find shorter range systems instead. You could, but we're not going to. And 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 again, the reason we're not going to is there's not a lot of places to shoot shorter range systems from. So you got to have long range systems because uh, for later. Are there other questions on the south side of the room or am I going to be doomed to go to a faculty meeting? Don't let it happen. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys are on notice. Mike. Oh, that's awesome. Mike and then over there. So um, I, I got red, red Zeppelins on my noodle. I can't get them off. Um, and I... <clears throat> What's really got them sort of spinning around my head was Saturday in the New York Times. There were two articles. One was front page article supposedly explaining, you know, why these balloons had some uh, 
you know, uh, strategic capability. But it, of course, the article then ends up saying the real problem is the gap in hypersonic coverage in the, the near Earth space. Okay, so I'm confused by that. Then there is a piece that quotes the Undersecretary for Policy by name following that, saying that this whole kerfluffle is uh, an example of a breakdown of civil military relations in China. So, <clears throat> but by the end of reading these two things, which are clearly both uh, leaks, uh, you know, designed to, uh, uh, you know, shape the narrative about what's going on. I have less understanding about what's going on in our assessment of the Chinese threat now than I than I had before. Can you can you help me understand uh, the dynamics from our side of this this whole business? So there are lots of little factoids that are hard to sew together in a compelling narrative. Um, and, and those are two, um, a pair of others that at least work together uh, are in the early days um, when it was still floating over, I guess, did it float over Indiana? Did you guys see it? You didn't see it, man. Um, I was out on the roof. Looking. <laughs> you, you and all of Texas. Um, in the early days, one of the reasons we were said to have not wanted to shoot it down was there might be explosives on board. And then over the weekend, the Post had an unnamed Pentagon official quoted as saying, uh, uh, these have self-destruct systems on them uh, and we think it malfunctioned. So I take those two as mutually supportive pieces of data to tell me a little something about normal con ops for the Chinese, which would have been the previous three, the previous four, three under the Trump administration, one early in the Biden administration would have spent a very little amount of time over US airspace and then either self-destructed or uh, maneuvered into a different part of the airspace that would have flown home. The other kind of tidbit that came out over the weekend, and I'd have to go find the source, it might have been the first New York Times article, was an off the record quote that said, um, we think they lost control over it relatively early. So but between those two, you know, almost data points and, and um, some of the others, my, my sense is they wanted to do a little bit of light espionage over what, missile defense radars or to see how we turn on things up in Alaska, uh, early warning systems, uh, lost control of the darn thing um, uh, and then couldn't blow it up. Um, and that, that kind of works. That's enough for me um, to, to explain it. Uh, Colin Call's uh, quote, is not incompatible with that. Um, it is merely recognition that uh, Xi Jinping as the single civilian in the military chain of command, right? He doesn't have an office of the Secretary of Defense populated with hundreds, if not thousands of civilians or retired military officers. He's got himself uh, and a little bit of a general office in the Central Military Commission. My guess is he told the uh, CMC, the Central Military Commission, back in 2014 or 2017, go do some more surveillance against the United States, period. And they went off and did a bunch of things. Um, uh, let's see, who was talking about, uh, might have been uh, David Logan or one of the PLA watchers was suspecting that this particular mission, that is uh, high altitude balloons, would have been the purview of the uh, strategic support force, when the Chinese military reorged in 2015, they created something that's very weird, the rocket forces to run all those missiles that we showed you pictures of. We don't have a rocket force, right? We've got Air Force and Space Force, but no rocket force. And they created a, a, a um, strategic support force, which certainly has elements of the space ISR and cyber uh, mission set incorporated in it. So maybe this fits there and maybe 
they think about intrusions into sovereign territory a little differently than other parts of the services. So that that also kind of, that coupled with a single Xi Jinping cannot know how many missions are being flown at what profile and so on, um, you know, uh, surrounding the the Blinken visit or or what have you. Um, so that 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 fits with the call quote. Could I just suggest one other element that seems directly related to your uh, concern about escalation? My interpretation, especially of the call uh, comments, was that we were worried that this thing was getting out of control. Um, and this thing meaning that particular vehicle or the crisis? No, the crisis. Mm -hmm. that, that, well, I mean, you know, first of all, the political crisis right. within the United States got crazy very quickly. I think we were embarrassed by that. But, you know, then all of a sudden the Chinese aren't answering the phone, you know, in the various hotline arrangements. Um, and, you know, so I, I wonder if that wasn't uh, a recognition that, uh, you know, this wasn't where we wanted it to go um, and that there is an appreciable escalatory uh, potential, um, you know, for incidents like this, that it happened in, you know, a different context, it, you know, could have been even more destabilized. My sense was that we weren't too worried about it in and of itself, the political dynamic notwithstanding, right? That there was going to be, because of our dysfunctional politics, um, some politicization of this. And that was the case almost from its first civilian sighting. That's baked in at that point. Um, whether we were worried much about what it could do, I, my sense was no, and there were a bunch of statements to that effect. We just turned off our comms once it was right over whatever base it, it was. Um, but, but I think the broad way that it puts a um, negative trajectory in the security relationship is correct, right? And uh, the example I worry about is, you know, so one of the reasons the Chinese do this is they don't have the ability, uh, sorry, I can't get my map back up. Um, they don't have the ability to fly from all those blue dots on uh, my penultimate map, uh, fly reconnaissance missions, right? And, and even uh, Malaysia sometimes lets us fly P-8 missions from Malaysian territory. And certainly the Japanese bases in peacetime support lots of 12 nautical miles plus an inch uh, flights outside of Chinese airspace to do exactly what that balloon was doing, which is listen into sense, listen into comms at low altitude. Exactly what I presume it was doing. Listen into communications at low altitude uh, and and uh, try to take whatever visual imagery you can. Again, that you can't get from a satellite much higher. Um, so this is a way for them to kind of respond to that. Well, uh, the balloon program might might have been a way for them to respond to that. Well. What are, what's going to happen the next time we fly an EC-131, 12 and a half nautical miles? Are the Chinese going to need to show that they too can shoot down things that are spying on them? I hope not, uh, but, but I fear they're going to need to, uh, to show something, right? And this is the EP-3 incident of 2001 all over again, um, but it's a little bit more deliberate, right? Uh, and, and that one was resolved after 11 days um, with some, some tension, but the security, the rest of the relationship was a lot better back then compared to where we are now. So yeah, that aspect I certainly do agree about. Hi, I'm Mark Witkowski. Do you have, uh, uh, do you believe that it's a given and absolute that the U.S. would respond militarily if the Chinese invaded Taiwan? And, and do you believe that there's a will of the American people to support such an action, particularly if, as you described, maybe the first action is an attack on Guam? I think after the First, uh, after Guam gets hit, yeah, it's hard for us to back down gracefully. Um, but the deliberate decision making going in, you know, I think is pretty likely. Um, that said, you know, uh, everybody's got a completely uh, transparent understanding about American politics and who's going to win in uh, 2024. And right, we're all on the same. I don't understand American politics anymore. And so what. Um, I'm not sure I ever did, but but uh, what a future MAGA-like uh, president might choose, um, whether it's the return of the previous or or somebody picking up that mantle, 
I think is a little hard to predict. And I think there are certainly um, signs of that in the discussion about aid to, to Ukraine. That said, a, main, a traditional mainstream Republican uh, administration or uh, a, a, a Dem, it's hard for me to imagine us not getting involved. And that's not just to, because of the personification of Biden four times now saying we would we would come to their aid. It's just I you know I think I think the headlines um, of you know red communist China invades democratic you know market economy former ally of Taiwan are are really hard to uh, uh, overcome uh, in in the American uh, body politic. But that said, you know what do I know about the American body politic? Um, I think there's also going to be a lot of uh, uh, inertia in the military to want to uh, get involved um, because of the strategic value of Taiwan, because it's the first step of, uh, uh, you know, a Hitler-esque expansion, which I think are, I think the latter is is dramatically overstated, but I, but I think nevertheless, it, it would be a narrative that would be out there. I'm going to take Fritz's question from online, but there are also more questions in the room. So uh, uh, Fritz Hansen uh, asked, um, you read the CSIS study that you recommended. There are many logical conclusions and suggestions in it, some of which support Dr. Toomey and some may not. So the war game has some contentious points and assumptions that cut both ways. Did you participate in the war games? And uh, what do you think of the game's assumptions, rules, and execution? you offer us some comments or critique on the yeah. conclusions and recommendations to this joint CSIS-MIT study? So uh, uh, the, the, the lead uh, on the study is a, a classmate of um, uh, Professor Lindley and Professor Goltz's uh, and mine from MIT, uh, Eric Hagenbotham, uh, someone I've worked with uh, quite a bit. So I didn't participate directly in the war game, but uh, know the structure of it well from engaging with him quite closely over a, again, a 30 year period. Um, uh, I, I think the, the main critique I would offer, um, maybe, maybe twofold. One, uh, you could rerun that a couple more times and, and call it the Ukraine variant. That is, Take what we think we've learned about Russian, Soviet, uh, Chinese communist uh, systems and organizations for battle and, and tactical uh, uh, nimbleness uh, and tweak some of the assumptions that go into the model and see whether that gives you different adjudication in some of uh, uh, the runs and, and maybe things come out a little bit better for for blue and maybe even for green for Taiwan. Um, the study was kind of already well underway when, when we started getting data from this new uh, conflict. Um, the, the other critique I would offer is, although it's a pretty positive set of outcomes, and uh, that is China doesn't win. They don't quite lose, but they don't win, right? They, they are unable to continue to support a uh, a, a, a force of tens of thousands that has landed in Taiwan. Um, the, the game doesn't try to go beyond that. And, and sort of by its design, it can't because the centrality of kind of modeling military exchange and missile uh, ranges and, and arsenal sizes, all that's kind of uh, gone by the wayside when you start thinking about war termination. Right, um, pretty relevant to thinking about Ukraine today as well. Right, how do we how do we end here? What is what does ending look like? It's it's fundamentally a, a, a political decision, not a military one. It's it's one that's enlightened by the military realities on the ground. Um, but but I think to me that's where I'd want to take the study further. And so while I while I find that set of uh, war games to be a very important rebuttal to another set of military leadership quotes, um, which is to be a little crass. 
um, uh, Bob Work, the deputy sec def, um, and uh, 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 Dave Ockmanic uh, at RAND, who was a former senior Pentagon official, would say, you know, routinely the U.S. gets its ass handed to it uh, in, in classified war games. And so I think having this other set of war games that are out there, very transparent, I think is a useful rejoinder um, you know, not as ever a perfect rejoinder, it's classified and the military side can, you know, uh, say, well, you don't know all, all of what we know. Uh, okay, fair enough, but what exactly is it, you know? Um, so I think it's important to have that out there, but I'd like to see them start to think through, or maybe the next stage would be to start to think through, what does war termination look like? Um, and, and again, the Chinese are gonna have opportunities to escalate out of a situation where they have 30,000 or 60,000 captured on the island of Taiwan, that doesn't look like a regime surviving uh, uh, end point to the war from my understanding as somebody who watches the Chinese regime. So they're gonna be gam gambling for resurrection. Where was, our, where was our strategic culture gambling you know, th th there for, for different reasons? Uh, and that again brings us to kind of nuclear cards or to thinking about expanding the war. So that would be the direction. Fritz, I would Great. push them. Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask about some uh, Navy questions. Uh, systemic problems that we have right now is recruiting is in the toilet, and that's for all the branches, and that will impact everybody not that far in the distant future. And how do you think that the spending program we have set up 40% going to replacing the ballistic missile submarines. The LCS is a disaster. Uh, F-35 is not looking nearly as rosy, of course, as the, the people promise us. You talk about all these wonderful systems we're going to have firing from the second and third chain of islands. We're spending every penny in Ukraine. That's where all of our missiles are, the ones that take 2.8 years, 3.5 years to produce each round. In 24, 36 months, China's going to be able to walk into wherever it wants to, and we really aren't going to have people or toys to resist them. I don't mean to push back on you, but yeah. it's a lot easier to play a handball against a wall than it is against a curtain. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the first half of the question, right? I think the LCS, um, the reconstitution of the LCS over the Navy's objections by Congress is appalling. Right, we were going to get rid of half of the LCS fleet because we can't build a clutch apparently in uh, in the high speed engine that, that goes sort of the central part of the, that that ship, uh, and we were going to retire uh, one of the two classes of those. And Congress said, no, 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 there's too many jobs in in the shipyards for them. So that kind of problem is a huge one for us for sure, um, and I think it gets us to the point where. We're heavily carrier dependent, um, uh, especially on those 11, you know, the, the, the most capable um, in ways that are not optimized for this fight. That said, uh, SM6s can go on all of uh, the ships that we have. I mean, every, I mean, down to the LCS, right? Uh, it, it, any Arleigh Burke, and we got 70 or odd of those, right? Um, can, can be quickly armed with anti-ship ballistic missiles and potentially some of the other systems that are coming along uh, down the line. So I think it's not that we would need to, for the Navy, build new capabilities from scratch, but we'll have to use some of those existing systems in, in kind of different operating modalities rather than those being air defense for the carrier uh, the Arleigh Burks, they're going to have to be uh, free ranging, you know, driving around in MCON strike assets. Um, and that's got some challenges, but doesn't require you to build a radically new ship design. Although I guess my other, my other suggestion for the Navy would be send all the uh, LA and Virginia class subs to the Pacific. And, uh, you know, that's something the Chinese don't have a real good answer for. And I think would be tremendously valuable. Three Virginias and the 11 remaining LA class that are deployed. And you're talking about 70 Burks, okay. Half med, half 7th fleet, third are underway, a third are repair, yep, yep. third are in dry dock. Okay, now you're down to 11 ships. You can put a couple of those in the bottom to close. What do you have left to fight? Right, no, I, I mean, I agree. It requires some large scale re 
uh, deployment of, of undersea and at sea assets to the region because this is a driver, whereas Ukraine is not one for U.S. naval forces. You know, I think on other areas, um, you know, exquisite uh, signals, intel and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, command and control assets, Ukraine is a direct competitor and maybe some of the industrial base. But I think for the Navy in particular, it's less so. Um, if I'm running Red Force for the next exercise, the first thing I do is I tell Kim, okay, cross the 38th. Right now you've got seven feet to tie the change and go within 72 hours. And then, I'm not going to say anything, but Xi can say, okay, I can do what I want to in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Because right now, seven feet can't do a thing because they are tied by treaty to operate in. And if it comes down to a choice between Korea or Taiwan, you think anybody in the five sides of fun is going to be able to make that choice? No, but I think the South Koreans will be able to do pretty well um, in and of themselves with less uh, support from us. Okay. A, a foot crosses the 30th parallel, they pull the tip bit and the op plan off the shelf, seven fleet goes into, that's not something that's possible. And I, I wish that we had the ability, we had 600 ships so we could send 40 ships to sort of Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be, those. we're going to have to make a resourcing decision, I agree, but I just think that at the at the national level, which which is going to be your priority, one one uh, offensive that's going to fizzle out, that is the Korean Peninsula, or one that will empower your uh, great power competitor. And I think that's a fairly straightforward uh, conclusion to, uh, or fairly straightforward question to answer. Um, I'm going to go to Rick next. Um, Rick, you're on Hi, uh, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a uh, fellow of Endis. Okay, um, they're all laughing at me. Uh, thank you very much for coming and talking with us. I find this topic extremely interesting. Um, I had a question uh, kind of regarding the strategic level of, of the uh, operational concept. Um, so kind of what's been dominating the room and dominating the discussion is talks of like uh, tactical um, considerations uh, strategic warfare kind of considerations, how many ships we can bring, how much manpower and firepower we can bring to the fight. Uh, but what we're not talking about is um, the the cost, benefit, cost to benefit ratio for both sides. Uh, I think China would absorb too much costs in any kind of armed conflict. I think the U.S. would absorb too much costs uh, in any armed conflict between each other. But what I do see is um, China's ability to operate in another sphere and actually produce um, real gains, uh, kind of like within the information environment. And so while this is consuming um, our attention and affecting uh, our calculus of how we want to engage with China over Taiwan and over the South China Sea, um, I think China's maybe using this to distract our attention and then employing information war fighting capabilities, um, such as within, uh, which China has a, a doctrine of three warfares for information uh, for the information environment, psychological warfare, media warfare, and legal warfare. And in the legal warfare environment, um, they would be employing, you know, state laws, international laws, um, to try and actually achieve their gains, and then using their, their military force to kind of back that up and help enforce it. But, um, I was just kind of curious your thoughts on that kind of aspect of it. That's a really broad set of um, Chinese approaches. And, and I guess at one level, I agree, we should spend more time thinking about um, some of those other aspects uh, of, of Chinese capabilities. Um, uh, you know, China is 70% of the U.S. economy today. Um, that gives them a lot of wherewithal to uh, compete in other domains. Um, that said, you know, and back to the issue of kind of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, values uh, being an important um, asset on, on our side, you know, what are the success stories of Chinese information warfare, right? They've tried hard to play a role in Australia's elections, 
in Taiwan's elections. They've they've muddled in South Korean domestic politics. They've they've uh, dabbled a little bit in uh, Japanese in terms of using coercive leverage there. Uh, Philippines again. In almost all those cases, it's backfired. Right. Malaysia is another interesting one um, uh, where where it's backfired maybe two or three times in a row back and forth. Um, so so it's not uh, maybe a done deal. But so you know I I think. Um, that sort of overt attempts to manipulate media mer- uh, messages can be pretty uh, transparent and and uh, not not super effective. Um, it's not always the case, uh, and and if you've got uh, local leadership who are willing to take the large bribes and and uh, do Beijing's bidding, then uh, okay. The good news for us is. That is not the case for major geostrategic uh, uh, potential partners in the United States that tend to be more established democracies. Um, on, on the legal warfare side, you know, again, um, uh, uh, Toomey's perspective, not that of the U.S. Navy, the budgetary concerns notwithstanding of the Navy, sure be nice to fully plus up the budget of state because uh, having more lawyers, having more uh, uh, U.S. representatives at international organizations that are talking about uh, the next development of internet uh, icon standards or, you know, whatever set of uh, uh, global infrastructure, you know, uh, in terms of the economic uh, uh, interchange between um, the globe is, is being negotiated. The, the Chinese are always there and always there in numbers and getting better. And uh, we're, we're simply not at the table as often as we should be. And I think that's something that we could do a lot better job at. Um, you know, the, the Chinese are a little bit hoisted by their own petard. Uh, if you if you look at the South China Sea kind of uh, PCA ruling from the Philippine case in 2016, this is not a, a successful case of Chinese legal uh, warfare. I, instead, now they've got something on, on the table that the U.S. isn't perfectly happy with. We like getting 200 nautical miles from things that look like rocks, but but sure, it looks pretty bad for the Chinese claims uh, in the South China Sea. Too. So, you know, I, I think we can uh, uh, compete effectively on those different levels, but we got to show up and showing up means funding organizations other than my home institution. But don't cut my pay. <laughs> um, so there are a couple more questions, but we are also one minute short at the end of our time. So I'm not going to recognize another question. If people if people do want to um, ask their question, they can come chat with Chris afterwards. He's a wonderful, nice guy. He will talk to you. He won't, you know, whatever. He's nice. So please do. <laughs> um, and um, uh, if you would all join me in thanking Chris for a really interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Great question. Thank you.